thank you for having me. And I want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen. So there are a few things I want to cover. The thyroid is such a broad um, topic, but I want to sort of uh, go over a few things that I, I get asked a lot. So we should be able to look at an, a, a general overview of a thyroid, how to do a thyroid exam, thyroid blood work, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, just really little blurbs about these. And then thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer. And then I would like to answer some of your questions. If you're able to, and certainly if you're not able to, don't worry about it. But if, you, if you're able to get a glass of water and a mirror and just keep it by you, uh, you will need that when we do a thyroid exam later on. But if you're not, don't worry about it if you're not able to do so. So, why am I not advancing? Here we go. What is a thyroid gland? And I, hopefully you can see me. So the thyroid gland is located in your neck, right? It's what we call it. It's a butterfly-shaped um, organ or shield-shaped organ that's sitting right here, really uh, above your collarbone. Right, And the thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone. This is a metabolic hormone that really is responsible for the metabolism of every organ system in the body. So it helps to keep you warm. It helps to keep the heart muscles beating. And um, at a regular rate, it helps every organ system. Therefore, you can imagine that it's necessary for the metabolism of every organ system. So thyroid disease, not surprisingly, can really be quite... Um, you know, the symptoms of thyroid disease can be quite extensive and quite big. And um, how does it work? The thyroid, I, I like to equate it to the thermostat in your house, right? Being able to produce heat and the heat in, in, in on its own would now feed back to the thermostat and shut it off. So the thyroid gland is under the regulation of the pituitary. The pituitary is a, a master gland that sits at the base of the skull right here. And the pituitary gland makes a lot of hormones, but for the purpose of a thyroid, the hormone that we are interested in is the TSH. So the thyroid stimulating hormone. Those of you who have thyroid disease or have loved ones with thyroid disease, you've heard about the TSH. So what the TSH does is that TSH is released from the pituitary gland and it goes in the bloodstream and gets to the thyroid and it works on the thyroid and stimulates the thyroid glands to release thyroid hormone. Now it releases T4 and T3, but T4 goes in the bloodstream and it bathes the pituitary gland. And the pituitary senses how much T4 there is, right? And for every one of us, there's a certain sweet spot for your TSH. So I, for instance, may have, you know, my TSH may be between 1 and 1.5. Someone else may be between 1.5 and 2, you know. Um, so we all kind of have where we live. And we also have where we live, I'm sorry, in terms of T4 as well. So it sort of maintains it in the normal range. So if for some reason my thyroid gland starts make or your thyroid gland starts making too much hormone, we call that hyperthyroidism. I keep going forward. So if you're hyperthyroid, what happens is that you now have a lot more thyroid hormone in circulation, right? That goes to the pituitary gland. So this is the, your gland sees this as too much more than it needs. And so what it does is shuts off TSH uh, stimulation of the thyroid. So you have a high T4 and a low TSH in hyperthyroidism. Um, I think I'll stop using this mouse. It's just um, getting advancing me. On the other hand, if for some reason your thyroid gland is failing for different reasons, and we can talk about this later on, what happens is that your thyroid hormone level is low. So the blood that goes to the pituitary gland carries a lower level of thyroid hormone than you're used to. And so the pituitary feels the need to stimulate your thyroid to produce more. And so the TSH is high. And the only exception to this rule is what if your pituitary gland is sick? And that can happen either due to trauma or a tumor. And some people are also born with just the inability without the pituitary gland or insufficiency of some hormones. If that happens, there's no message going from your pituitary gland to your thyroid gland. So your TSH is low. And because there's no message going to the thyroid gland, in addition, there will be your thyroid hormone level will be low. So, but luckily this is very, very unusual. So let's, um, looking at it then, 
the major thyroid hormone that we, we the, that your body produces is T4, right? That's about 80 to 85% of the thyroid hormone that your, your thyroid gland will release. Uh, but it also releases a different hormone called T3, which is about 20% of the hormone that you release. But the actual hormone that is active in your system is T3. The difference between T3 and T4 is that T4 has four iodine molecules and T3 has three. But T4, we call it a pro-hormone because it's not really active. It's not what works on your receptors. It has to be converted to T3, which happens in the liver and brain and some other tissues for it to be active. So um, T4 and T3 circulate, they, they're bound to certain proteins, right? They're bound to albumin and certain specific proteins that bind thyroid hormone. And, um, and you kind of have, and, and this can be measured. So when you measure your total T4 and your total T3, it's a combination of both the bound and the free one. But actually what your receptor sense is the one that is free. So strictly speaking, you can just check the free hormone. Now there are certain some conditions where you have a, 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 a lot of uh, binding proteins and that can happen in pregnancy, for instance, or in women who are on birth control pills. So you have the whole pool of T4 being larger, but in reality, it doesn't change the amount of free hormone that you have if your thyroid is able to make that. So that those are sort of things that can make interpretation of thyroid function a little bit more uh, complicated. So let's look at the blood work, thyroid function tests. What are the thyroid function tests that you'll commonly see where you know, your primary care will check? The first one is the TSH. Remember, if you remember from me showing you the physiology of the thyroid, the TSH or the thyroid stimulating hormone is that hormone that's made by your master gland or your pituitary gland, right? To which regulates the activity of the thyroid. It's usually the best initial test to check thyroid function. And it changes quite rapidly, as you can imagine, just like the thermostat, right? As soon as any, any level any change in the level of your actual thyroid hormone. So before you can even sense that there's something wrong, the TSH changes uh, because its job is to make sure that your thyroid maintains a normal amount of thyroid hormone. So in hypothyroidism, the TSH goes up because its job is to stimulate the thyroid to make more hormone. And in hyperthyroidism, it, go, it is low and obviously it's normal in, in other situations. Uh, T4 is also another blood work that is checked when you're checking for thyroid, uh, uh, thyroid disease, right? This is the main hormone that is in circulation and, and it's bound, like I said, in, to binding proteins. But you're also able to get your free T4. So for instance, if, you're, if I were doing blood work in a pregnant woman, I may choose to get a free T4 rather than a total T4. Uh, because I expect the total T4 to be uh, higher, right? Because there is a lot more binding protein. So the free T4 may give me a better idea in, uh, in terms of how much thyroid hormone there is. So um, T3 is useful really for, it's only useful for, it's best uh, ordered when you're thinking that someone may be hypothyroid. So if you were thinking of an underactive thyroid gland or hypothyroidism, then the T3 is not really necessary. It's not called for, right? It's elevated in hypothyroidism. And actually, there are some types of hypothyroidism where the T4 may be normal, but the T3 is elevated. And we call that T3 thyroid toxicosis. You're also able to measure the free T3, but... Um, uh, we, we, you have to be cautious. You, you, we need to know what our labs are because not every lab is able to measure it accurately. Some, uh, some assays are not reliable. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard about reverse T3 and there are all sorts of questions out there. Should you, is, what is the utility of reverse T3? Should we be checking reverse T3? Reverse T3 is a biologically inactive um, uh, type of T3. Right, it's actually a, it's a, a way of inactivating T3, and so it really has no biologic activity, and there's really no reason it's not helpful to check T3 in someone who's helpful now who's healthy. Occasionally, we'll check a reverse T3 when someone is hospitalized and there's some information we're trying to get. But normally, for someone who has no other medical problems, there's really, really no utility to checking a reverse T3. So let's put it all together. 
We know that someone who has a normal functioning thyroid, their TSH will be normal, T4 will be normal, and T3 will, will be normal. But really, when, when you're screening for someone, you know, when you're screening, there's, there's no need to check a T3 in someone you suspect to have normal thyroid function. In hypothyroidism, TSH will be high, T4 will be low, and T3 will be low. And in hyperthyroidism, right, because you have a lot high, high T4 and high T3, the pituitary gland that makes TSH pulls back, so TSH is low in hyperthyroidism. So that inverse relationship, which can be quite confusing. So what about antibody tests? Um, there are some commonly produced antibodies in the system. What is an antibody? It's, it's a protein that's produced by your immune system, right, to guard you against foreign invaders, right? So it's really supposed to um, keep you safe. And it's produced by your lymphocytes. And for you to know that something is foreign or, you know, an invader, it ha you have to be able to recognize your own cell. So generally, you know your own cell and your, your immune system is supposed to be able to uh, protect you against invaders. But sometimes these lymphocytes, however, can produce antibodies against your own self, right? So in the thyroid, it can produce specific antibodies against your thyroid. Some of these antibodies are blocking. They're more common. We see that more commonly, but occasionally they can also produce antibodies that can drive your thyroid to make more hormone than usual and cause hyperthyroidism. So the common ones, some, some people will be familiar with it, the, um, the anti-thyroid peroxidase antibodies and the anti-thyroglobulin antibodies. So we quite often find that in, in an autoimmune disease of a thyroid called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is the most, one of the most common causes of hypothyroidism, the anti-thyroid peroxidase antibody and possibly the anti-thyroglobulin antibody will be positive. So it's only helpful when you want to determine the cause of hypothyroidism. But once you make that diagnosis, there's no point following the anti-thyroglobulin or anti-TPO antibodies. So it's a one-time test, really. Now, the thyrotropin receptor antibodies, or what we call the TRAB or the TSI, uh, is also another type of antibody that you check when you're suspecting hyperthyroidism. So it is positive in, uh, in the type of hyperthyroidism caused by Graves' disease, right? So and it, unlike the Hashimoto's or anti-thyroid anti peroxidase antibodies, it's actually quite helpful occasionally to follow these antibodies because it can help you predict when you can stop medication or when you stop medication, whether the person is likely to relapse or whether the person can, can sustain remission. But it's also helpful in pregnant women to check this because you want to know whether it's positive in mom because you want to predict whether or not this antibody can cross into the, the fetus and whether the fetus needs to be monitored more closely. Now, there's another thyroid test which um, we, we commonly check. It's a tumor marker, it's thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin is a, is a protein that is produced by normal thyroid cells, but it's also produced by thyroid cancer cells. So we usually would monitor thyroglobulin when we're treating patients with thyroid cancer. People who have already had their surgery, we would monitor thyroglobulin. It can tell us when there's very early, when there's early recurrence or when there's persistent thyroid cancer. We don't use it though. It's not used to diagnose thyroid cancer. So talking about hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroidism is an overactive thyroid gland. Right, the most common causes are Graves' disease, thyroiditis, postpartum, thy postpartum thyroiditis, and toxic nodules and excess um, thyroid medication. Graves' disease is usually it's an autoimmune disease, and it's usually the most common type of thy hyperthyroidism in young people. Whereas um, a toxic nodule or multiple nodules that are producing too much hormone, we call it toxic multinodular goiter, is more common as we get older. And it's also actually more common in iodine deficient areas, which um, America, uh, US is not. The symptoms of uh, hyperthyroidism or an overactive thyroid gland include uh, racing heart or palpitations. You may notice increased nervousness or irritability. Uh, there might be increased sweating. Uh, problems with sleeping, increased anxiety. There may also be weight loss. There can be more frequent bowel movements. 
So these are all symptoms that are suggested about hyperthyroidism. And so how do we diagnose it? We diagnose it by doing blood work. Like I said earlier, you check your TSH and you check a free T4 and a free T3 in hyperthyroidism. And what you expect to find is that the TSH is low and the free T4 and the free T3 will maybe high. You can also check antibodies because that will help you determine whether this is uh, autoimmune thyroidism or Graves' disease. Uh, a nuclear scan may be necessary, particularly if there is a nodule. So if there's a nodule, you might want to find out whether or not this nodule is reason for the hyperthyroidism or whether there's something else uh, going on. And typically, the treatment of the hyperthyroidism depends on what's causing it. So if it's Graves' disease, you treat it a different way. You can treat it with pills or you can treat it with radioactive iodine, which is iodine that is uh, radioactive, which you swallow just a one-time thing and it will kill the thyroid gland. It can also be treated by surgery. So the treatment depends on, you know, what you want, what you have, what's causing the hyperthyroidism, and also depends on your preference as well. What about hypothyroidism? So hypothyroidism, that is an underactive thyroid gland, is actually quite common, right? It, it's very common. It's, a, it's mostly caused by a, the most... Uh, um, the most uh, frequent cause of hypothyroidism is autoimmune thyroid disease, which runs in families. And by the way, it's more common in women than men, right? Radioactive iodine treatment or radiation treatment can also kill off the thyroid and cause hypothyroidism. People can also have surgery of the thyroid for reasons. It could be because of a nodule. It doesn't have to be a nodule that's making too much hormone. It could also be because... You know, you have a nodule that is causing pressure. People have surgery for different reasons. So that can lead to hypothyroidism as well. Uh, certain medications that are commonly used, like a heart medication called amiodarone, can cause um, hypothyroidism. Amiodarone is actually funny. Amiodarone can cause both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Things like lithium. And then a lot of the newer medications that we're using to treat um, cancers while they do a phenomenal job with uh, keeping cancers at bay, they can cause thyroid, hypothyroidism as well. Other causes of hypothyroidism is what we call thyroiditis, which is an inflammation of the thyroid gland. Iodine is, is a funny one. Iodine can actually cause hypothyroidism. So yes, iodine is good, uh, but iodine supplements can cause an underactive thyroid gland, particularly in people who may have underlying Hashimoto's thyroiditis. People who have pituitary problem also can have hypothyroidism. And very, very, very rarely you can have infiltration of the thyroid gland by diseases like amyloidosis, and that can cause hypothyroidism. The symptoms of hypothyroidism, remember the function of the thyroid hormone is to regulate the metabolism of every organ system. So it makes sense that it, it, you know, the symptoms can be quite, quite wide uh, ranging. So you can feel cold because you're not generating more uh, enough heat. You may be tired because, again, you don't have as much energy. You may have dry skin. You can have constipation because the bowel isn't moving as readily because it doesn't have sufficient thyroid hormone. People can get feel depression, right, because the brain is not getting enough thyroid hormone. And you can get forgetful. There may be weight gain or difficulty losing weight rather than weight gain, yeah, per se. And how do you diagnose it? So you diagnose it by doing blood tests, by checking a TSH and a free T4. And usually the treatment is quite simple. You usually treat it with thyroid pills or levothyroxine. There are different preparations, and I have sort of listed the most common ones here. Um, you know, uh, so. The, we, we typically will treat with T4, and I have that. There's another slide where we'll talk about it, whether there is need for combination therapy. We'll talk about it earlier, uh, later on. So there are different preparations of, of thyroid hormone. There is uh, generic levothyroxine, um, which, which is covered by most insurances and, and is inexpensive. And really, there's no reason why most people can't take generic uh, levothyroxine, but occasionally, someone may be a little hep sensitive or may have a little problem regulating their thyroid hormone as, as well. So we may go with brand name Synthroid or, or, or 
uh, levoxyl. So these are all brand name preparations. Now, desiccated thyroid hormone or Sorry, just go, go back to that. So desiccated thyroid hormone or amothyroid is out there. It's really not, uh, this is a thyroid extract that comes, that is derived from pig, right? And it contains a combination of T4 and T3. And um, it, it, some people, there are some patients who are on it. Uh, it's not considered a medication. It's considered a supplement. And so you can, you can buy it. Um, the, the problem with the T4 and T3 is that the, the, the proportion or the ratio of T4 and T3 that you have in pigs is not really the same as we have in, in animals. But having said that, there are people who are on it and are comfortable with it. So how about uh, T3 alone, there, it's not recommended to take T3 alone for replacement of your thyroid because you need high levels of T3. And T3, remember, is the one that's active. So it will cause you to have more palpitations. It will cause the bone loss over a period of time. People have a harder time sleeping when they're on T3. And overall, your thyroid hormone levels will be much higher. So it's not recommended. Now, T3 and T4 combination, however, the question is, is one superior to the other? There have been studies looking at, you know, combination therapy of T4 and T3 versus T3 alone to see whether, you know, it is superior. And there really is no consistent evidence to show that combination therapy is any better. So we continue to give people T4, and that is a recommendation of the American Thyroid Association. Having said that, there are people who just don't feel right on just T4 alone. Whether it's because it's, it's, it's T4 alone or whether it's something that we really don't understand, it's not clear. And so in, in such people, it makes sense to do a trial of T4 and T3 together, uh, you know, to, to do it for about three to six months to see whether there is an improvement. And if there is improvement, you can stay with it. But if there's no improvement, you can stop. Um, so that's as much as I will say. What about thyroid nodules? So here is where if you have your water and your mirror, I would like you to um, get it. So the thyroid gland, like I said, is right here in the neck. So what we want to see is, do you have a thyroid nodule? So what I suggest you do is just stretch out your neck like this and uh, take a look and see in the mirror whether you can see a lump, right? The thyroid is right here. So you might see a lump here. If your thyroid gland is a little bigger, you might see it. Like, I don't know if you can see my neck, but you might see it extending a little further out. So take a look at your neck in the mirror. Now, I would like you to take your water and take a sip of water and hold it in your mouth and now swallow while you're watching yourself in the mirror very closely, looking at your neck. Now, take another sip and swallow. And what, keep your eyes on your thyroid. Can you see any swelling? Can you see any lump as you swallow? That may be a thyroid nodule. If you could see a lump, I'd like you to now place your finger on that lump and now take another sip of water and swallow. If it moves up and down and it's in your thyroid, that, that, is, that is most likely a thyroid nodule. So, and you can do this for yourself. Uh, you can have a practice on yourself today, later on today, if you didn't have the water and you weren't able to do it. Practice on a loved one, right? And uh, that's how you can identify a thyroid nodule. So take a look, take a sip of water and, and, and swallow, and you'll see your thyroid gland move up and down. Right, you see, man. So about 18% of women over the age of 55 will have a thyroid nodule. And approximately about 14, 15% of men over the same age will have thyroid nodules. So thyroid nodules are much more common in women. They are common, um, they get more common as we get older. And uh, you'll find that about three to 5% of, of, of uh, women around the age of 25 to 30 will have thyroid nodules. The good news about thyroid nodules is that 90 to 93% of them will be benign, will not be cancer. So that's great news. And typically, it's possible to have a thyroid nodule, multiple nodules, and have no symptoms. Most majority of people don't know it's there, right? 
you can identify it on physical exam. Like we said, you can identify it yourself or your primary care or your care provider can identify it when they do a, a physical exam. Or you can identify it when you have imaging for what or for other reasons. So a lot of people may have carotid, Doppler, and they'll find that there is a nodule there. Or you may have a CAT scan for a different reason and you find that there is a nodule. The first thing you do after identifying a nodule is to check the thyroid blood work because it will determine what you do next. So you check the thyroid blood work to see whether the person is hype, whether you're hypothyroid or whether your thyroid function is normal or underactive. Now, depending on the size of the thyroid nodule and whether or not you're hypo or hypothyroid, you would, either, you would get an ultrasound or, and you may get a biopsy of the thyroid nodule, right? But if, you have, you may, if you're hyperthyroid, then you may go and get a nuclear scan. So, um, so assuming that your primary care does the blood work and it's normal and they identify the nodule, they will send you for an ultrasound just to be sure uh, that there is a nodule there. And when you see the nodule, depending on the size of the nodule, you'll be sent for a fine needle aspiration, which is done on the ultrasound guidance. So fine needle aspiration is an office procedure. We do it in our office. Everyone does it in their office, but it can also be done in radiology, right? And what happens is that you're, you're, you, know, you, you lay on a table and um, the, the area is cleaned out and then using a needle, the size of what is used for blood draw, right? Uh, uh, samples are taken, maybe about three or four needle sticks into that nodule to take samples uh, for evaluation to determine whether or not this is benign and can be followed or whether you need to go to the next step. And this is done, you know, all the while picturing your uh, nodule on the ultrasound. This is a, a really safe procedure. And I hear someone thinking, well, would that spread cancer if it's cancer? No, we haven't found, we found that it's safe and it doesn't spread the cancer. So this is safe and it's been around for years and that's the way to assess thyroid nodules. When you have a biopsy for thyroid nodule, uh, what happens afterwards? Well, if it's benign, right, you, you, you can be followed by ultrasounds. So depending, the way, depending on the appearance of the nodule, you may, the recommendation may be for you to have an, a repeat ultrasound in one year or someone else may have theirs repeated in two years because appearance of thyroid nodules can sort of can vary. And then less frequently if it stays stable thereafter. And most thyroid nodules do stay stable. So they, they don't really grow significantly. But if they do grow, then you repeat the biopsy one more time. And then if it's still, continue, if it's still benign, you really don't need to continue following it if you've had two negative biopsies. Now, some nodules obviously may be, be cancer. The good news is that that percentage is quite small. And if that is the case, you, you go to surgery. Now, about 25% of the time when you do a biopsy, though, for a thyroid nodule, you can't classify it as either benign or cancer. So what we do then when we find that someone who falls into that category is that we now send the sample out to a special lab for molecular markers where they look at the uh, DNA and the RNA expression of, those, of the nodule to see whether there's anything that is suspicious in it, you know, um, what you might find or what has been identified in some thyroid cancers. So if it is benign, then you're done, right? And you don't have to go through unnecessary surgery. But if it is suspicious, the, the risk of cancer goes up to about 40% in that instance, 40 to 50%. So we would then recommend that you have surgery, usually just to take out that loop, because that's the only way to confirm whether it's benign or not. Um, so sometimes thyroid nodules can be can be, they can make thyroid hormone, right? So you would you would send the person for nuclear imaging, right? You would do nuclear imaging when a nodule is, when the person is either hyperthyroid, um, and, and so that's where you would use this imaging. Thyroid cancer, luckily, this is rare, like I said. So one in 16 to one in 20 uh, of thyroid nodules you see will prove to be cancer. 
right? Um, the, the good news is that there are different types of thyroid cancer, but the more common th types of thyroid cancers, like the papillary thyroid cancer, have excellent prognosis. Now, we, we look at cancers in general. We try to sort of make, make it uniform in the way we assess thyroid cancer. So we look at five-year mortality. So the most common type of thyroid cancer, papillary thyroid cancer, five-year mortality, it's five years, sorry, five-year survival is 95%. So very few people with the most common type of thyroid cancer will actually go on to die of that disease. So that is very, very reassuring. Um, typically, uh, the treatment for thyroid cancer is thyroidectomy. And you can either have a total thyroidectomy or you can have a partial thyroidectomy depending on the size of the, of the original tumor. So this is something uh, that, that we do and uh, that is best done by an endocrine surgeon who is quite experienced. Some patients who have a total thyroidectomy may require uh, extra treatment with radioactive iodine, right? which is a pill, a capsule that is swallowed and goes to the thyroid. The idea is to kill off whatever uh, remaining thyroid tissue is there to make it easier to follow, but it can also kill off any remaining thyroid cancer cells as well. So, uh, but not everybody requires it. And certain patient people who have one lobe out alone, they're considered low risk. That's the reason why they had just a lobectomy. They, require, they do not require uh, radioactive iodine treatment. So, commonly asked questions you know, um, is iodine good for me? So I hear that quite a lot, right? So the thyroid hormone is made up of iodine, right? Four molecules of iodine. So if iodine is needed for the formation of thyroid hormone, it must be good for me. And the, the answer is, is sort of, it depends. Um, the, unless you go out of your way to eat a diet that is really low in iodine. If you eat a normal balanced diet in, um, in the US, you probably have sufficient iodine, unless you're a pregnant woman, in which case you, you, you want to make sure that you're on prenatal multivitamin and actually that you, you take a look at that uh, prenatal vitamin and make sure that it has iodine. So iodine can cause, if, you, if you're taking it as a supplement, can cause hyperthyroidism and it can also cause hypothyroidism. So we don't really recommend iodine supplements, you know, unless you have reason to suspect that you're profoundly iodine deficient. What about selenium? Selenium is used as part of the uh, formation of thyroid hormone. But again, there is no uh, evidence right now to show that, that you need to take uh, selenium. That it will, uh, so we don't recommend taking selenium. What about natural? Is natural thyroid supplement better for me? Well, uh, most of the thyroid hormones that we have, you know, like uh, Synthroid, Levoxyl, they are synthetic thyroid hormones. So when people say natural thyroid hormone, they're usually referring to armor thyroid or desiccated thyroid, which I, I, I told you earlier is pig thyroid. Um, well, if it's pig thyroid, it's not human thyroid. So I don't necessarily know that it's better for you. And like I said, the ratio of T4 and T3 in pig thyroid is, is um, T3 is much higher in, pig, in pigs than it is in humans. So I, I, we don't recommend it. And we certainly don't recommend T3 in pregnancy. So even if you're taking it uh, and you're tolerating it and you feel better on it, we, we discourage it in pregnancy. It's really not, it's not recommended in pregnancy. What about biotin? Biotin is a, a supplement, right? That's been, uh, that's actually got very popular over the last few years, which is fine. It's good for hair and it's good for nails. And so a lot of people are taking it. Biotin is not bad for the thyroid and it has no effect on the thyroid. However, what it does is that it can interfere with the assays, right, that we use to check thyroid hormone levels. So what we recommend is that if you're taking your biotin and you have hypothyroidism, that's fine, take it. But if you're going to do blood work, stop the biotin supplements for about three days before you do your blood work and then get your blood work done and then you can restart the biotin. And one final question, you know, that I sometimes hear, you know, in pregnancy, 
we we recommend not taking a lot of medications or some medications may not be safe in pregnancy. So people ask, should I stop taking my thyroid medication in pregnancy? And the answer is absolutely not. You need your thyroid medication in pregnancy. And as a matter of fact, in pregnancy, um, women need a much more thyroid hormone than, than their thyroid hormone requirement goes up in pregnancy. So we actually recommend that a, a woman who has on, an underactive thyroid gland and is on treatment, when they find out they're pregnant, that they increase their thyroid hormone pills by two extra pills a week before, and then give us a call so we, we can check the thyroid function. And we would monitor the thyroid function throughout pregnancy every four weeks for the first trimester and then after the, sorry, the, second, uh, after the second trimester. And then after the second trimester, we monitor it maybe every six weeks. Um, in, in pregnancy, the first trimester of pregnancy, the fetus, the baby, uh, depends on mom for thyroid hormones. So it's really important not only that you're taking it, but that your thyroid hormone levels are normal. And uh, so our program at Base State, I want to just uh, take a minute to introduce my colleagues. This is me. And, um, and these are my colleagues, uh, Dr. Apanta and Dr. Isra uh, Jamal, who are the thyroidologists in our team. So our team, um, you know, we see thyroid patients and we do their uh, ultrasound and biopsy. Our thyroid program is a one-stop consultation and ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration. Because we found out years ago that it can be quite stressful when you're diagnosed, when, when you're told you have a thyroid nodule. Uh, even though we know most of them are benign, we, we just can't help it. We're anxious. I mean, we're human. So when you have someone come in and do a, a consultation and then they go home and then they have to be scheduled for a biopsy, it just prolongs the, the anxiety. So we decided to set up a clinic where you have your, alter, uh, your consultation and your biopsy at, uh, at the same time. And uh, like I said, when they're indeterminate, we send them for molecular markers. And actually what we try to do when we can is to anticipate it so that we can save the sample and we don't have to bring you back and do another biopsy. Sometimes you, you, you do, uh, but we try to avoid that. We collaborate with endocrine surgery. Um, we have dedicated cytopathologists who actually review these things for us so that, um, you know, we don't, and we, we review them with them as well in a pathology conference. And we also collaborate with nuclear medicine and, and hemonc for uh, more complicated thyroid cancers. Uh, we also do in and outpatient radioactive iodine administration. So, I have some sources for you uh, in case you you want to find out more about your thyroid and and you know there's a lot more that we could talk about and we certainly I mean I just scratched the surface we certainly can if you would like if you're interested uh, let us know what else you would like to hear about about the thyroid uh, the American Thyroid Association has a patient information uh, source that you can go to and find out a, a lot more about the thyroid. And I have uh, these two additional sources. So the archivals of internal medicine also has some resources as well. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, doctor. That was really informative and really my first time attending a thyroid lecture. So I appreciate all your expertise. There are some questions in the Q&A box, and I'm happy to um, review them for you. Uh, Amanda has a couple. The first one is, how is the thyroid test done? Question mark, blood work? Yes, the thyroid test is done by blood work. Um, Excellent. Yes, it's blood work. And then the second question is for the nodule eva uh, evaluation, do you use local anesthesia? So good question. Great question. Um, we do, but, but there's no universal um, agreement on, on whether or not you should use uh, local anesthesia. The thyroid is a small organ and, and the nodules aren't great and, and that big either. So uh, you, you use a little bit of local, I use at least my group, some people in my group use a little bit of local anesthesia that you inject in there just to take the edge off the pain. 
some people don't believe in using local anesthesia because they say, well, you know, they, it, that the discomfort is just as much. Uh, by the time you give the uh, anesthesia, you might as well use your needle. So it kind of varies. Um, but I do, and some of my, some people do, and some people do not. Thank you. Um, the next question is, could you please explain what a thyroid storm is? Oh, absolutely. So a thyroid storm is um, something that you see in someone who is hyperthyroid, right? What it is, is really an exaggerated presentation of hyperthyroidism to the, fact, to the extent where the person is really, really, really sick from uncontrolled hyperthyroidism, right? So, so, and you can, it can happen in anyone. It could be the first time that the person is being identified as being hyperthyroid, or it can happen in someone who already has been known to be hyperthyroid, but hasn't been taking their medication. And so what happens is all the symptoms of hyperthyroidism are exaggerated. So their heart is racing. So the heart rate may be up to 150. They in, almost invariably have a fever. Um, they may be altered. They may be confused. Some people may actually be in coma. Sometimes they're so sick that they have fluid in their lungs. So it's an emergency. We don't have a lot of emergency in endocrinology, but this is one of the endocrine emergencies. Um, that's what thyroid storm is. Thank you. Um, Maureen would like to know if there's an increase in thyroid cancer. And are there preventative measures? Um, a great, great question again. And there is. Um, there is an increase in cancers in general. Uh, but unfortunately, thyroid cancer is one of the most rapidly um, in rising cancers. It's actually number two now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we don't know why. You know, we speculate that uh, we know that exposure to radiation increases incidence of thyroid cancer. Um, but we think that there are things in, in, in what we call endocrine disruptors, you know, things in your household, everyday things that, that may also be, be accelerating the incidence of thyroid cancer. But we, we haven't been able to identify any one thing. And so there's really nothing that we can do or that we ought to do to prevent it, except, you know, be healthy, uh, eat healthy, try and uh, exercise. But there's really nothing that we have identified so far that will prevent uh, thyroid cancer. The good news is, though, that people do well from most common causes of thyroid, uh, most, most common types of thyroid cancer. Thank you. That is reassuring. Susan would like to know what would cause a sudden issue with T4 three times normal? Um, so T4 being three times normal. Uh, so I'm assuming, so a couple of things. I'm assuming that it's real, right? So whenever we have a, a blood test in endocrinology, our first step is to say, is this real? So we repeat it. Now, I'm assuming also that this was checked along with a TSH. So if TSH, and T, so if T4 is, is four times normal, then I would expect that the TSH is low, indicating hyperthyroidism, right? And so any number of things can cause it. It could be Graves' disease, which is the autoimmune disease where your body makes uh, antibodies. And that's usually what will cause the T4 this high. It could also be an inflammation of the thyroid gland called the thyroiditis. Those are the, typically the most common things. You also want to make sure, uh, so if the T4 is really high, but the TSH is normal, then you question whether this is real. So that's where I would ask, are you on biotin? Are you on any supplements that may cause biotin that is fooling the assay? Thank you. Uh, Pamela would like to know, what is thyroid eye disease? Thyroid eye disease, a great is, um, what that is, is um, eye problem that happens in people with Graves' disease. So Graves' disease is an uh, autoimmune disease, right, where the body produces antibodies that drive the production of thyroid hormone. The body also can produce antibodies that can react with proteins in the eye. So for some people, uh, they, you, you may notice eye, the eyes start bulging. 
For some people, the eyes may not bulge, but may be red and swollen and buggy. So uh, there are different grades of Graves, uh, uh, Graves eye disease or Graves of thermopathy. And uh, it is treated differently, not just that. So you treat the hyperthyroidism, but you have to actually address the eye disease. For most people, it's mild, but some, can, some people can have uh, severe uh, Graves eye disease or thyroid eye disease. Thank you. Zena would like to know, what is the first line treatment for Graves disease? Is it resection if thyroid, or do you trial PTU first? So um, it depends on the person. It depends on uh, personal preference. So if you're very hypothyroid, we recommend trying medic getting medication first, right? And getting your levels a little bit more normal. Then you can make it, you know, you're better able to, you're sa it's safer, first of all, for any other intervention. And you, you yourself are thinking more clearly then, and you can now make an informed decision about what you want to do. So um, a few people don't want to take medication or they may re react to medication. It could be PTU, it could be methimazole. But generally speaking, we don't use PTU any, as first-line treatment for adults, except in, in the first trimester of pregnancy. And that's because of uh, so, some things that we found, uh, maybe the risk of liver disease that we found years ago. So we use methimazole, which is a sister to PTU. So most people will go with PTU first, and some people may choose to stay on it. Uh, very few people will go straight to surgery, um, unless you have very mild hypothyroidism. There's also the option of giving you radioactive iodine actually to kill off the thyroid, right? So you, which is almost like doing non-surgery surgery with radioactive iodine without having to go under the knife. So most of my patients, I try the medication, antithyroid therapy, methimazole first and get them normalized. And then we talk about whether or not they want surgery or radioactive iodine but it's a matter of uh, personal preference. Thank you. Um, Maureen would like to know uh, her blood, why her blood work would border on abnormal when her ultrasound was normal. Good question. So that, and B, again, I'm assuming that this was repeated and if it's still abnormal, uh, but the ultrasound is normal, that means that there is no nodule there. Then the most common cause is low-grade autoimmune thyroid disease like Graves' disease. So checking the antibodies, so checking the TRAB or TSI, you may, you may find that, which is blood work, uh, your, your, you may find that the, the antibody may be positive, but about 10% of people with uh, autoimmune thyroid disease or Graves' disease may not have positive antibodies. Other things that can cause um, abnormal thyroid blood work when the ultrasound is normal, it could be a variant of normal. So if this is the first time you're getting your thyroid levels checked, remember we say normal is, you know, from here to here. Uh, but what is truly normal, that, that catches about 95% of the population, right? 2.5% will have a TSH that is below that lower cutoff point, and 2.5% will have a TSH that's above that upper cutoff point. So you may be that person who is lower, who was born that way, uh, but we never really knew. Uh, but if you had normal results before and now it's low, the most common reason is borderline uh, hypothyroidism. But also women in the first trimester of pregnancy can have the same sort of thing. So their TSH runs lower because of other hormones in their system. Thank you, excellent. Um, Bridget would like to know, have the blood level range of numbers to determine if you're, if you have hyper or hypothyroid changed? And she says, if you mentioned this in the beginning, she apologizes. She was like, oh no, I did not mention it. And, um, no, they have not changed. Um, the, the different labs have different numbers, but they're all sort of around the same. So for, for instance, in Bay State, our, our range is 0.4, used to be 0.4 to 4. Actually, in the last year, that upper range went up to 4.2. Um, some labs is 0.5 to 5. And um, 
but it hasn't really changed. So we know that the general population sort of runs around the same level. Now, now and then there have been debates as to whether or not true normal, it should be more narrow. But I think that when we looked at big, big population samples, we have concluded that where we are seems to be a safe place. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, Chris is asking if I see her question, um, but I don't see it. I would suggest you put it to all panelists to the drop down. Um, the next question, this person says that she feels a lump in her throat and she's trying to see an endocrinologist and her first appointment is June 2022. Is that too long to wait? Um, yeah, well, June 2022 to see someone is long. It, it really is. Um, I, I understand that there is a shortage of, you know, and, and maybe they, can, they can't see you because they just don't have the availability. What can sometimes be helpful is going to your primary care doctor or provider and they can do a thyroid exam. Now, it's not all the time that we can feel a nodule if it's there. So if, if, even if they don't feel one, they can send you to radiology to get an ultrasound, and that will tell us whether there's a nodule. So that will be at least the first step. And if there is no nodule, then you probably don't need to see an endocrinologist anyway, right? Because um, it's not the thyroid that's causing that lump in the throat. Thank you. John would like to know what are the what other illnesses can occur as a result of thyroid issues, grave disease. He says he's aware of the thyroid eye disease. Right, and there's a, there's another one. Um, you can have what we call a thyroid skin disease, uh, or uh, what we call dermopathy. So there can be abnormality in the skin, as common, not as common as eye disease. You can also have some subtle nail changes as a result of hy hyperthyroidism. Again, not as common. So eye disease is the most common um, extra thyroid manifestation of Graves' disease. Thank you. Kathy would like to know, can someone have a normal TSH but still have a thyroid problem? Um, very, very seldom. And when I say, when you say thyroid problem, I mean, I assume you mean an overactive or underactive thyroid and not the thyroid nodule. So you can have a thyroid nodule with a normal TSH. Um, but if your thyroid levels or your TSH is normal, quite often you don't have another problem. The only exception is, remember, if you remember the slide where I said, if you have a problem with your pituitary gland, where the gland is sick, then the TSH can be normal, but it's fooling you, right? You might actually not have much thyroid hormone. So that's why if, if you have symptoms, then the TSH is not a good screening test. You need a TSH and a, T, a, a, free T, a T4 when someone has symptoms because you can miss secondary or pituitary uh, hypothyroidism. Thank you. Chris says, I have a reaction to any contrast dyes in cosmetics with iodine. Is this a relation to my hypothyroidism? Um, no, I don't, I don't know. It, is, it isn't, um, it isn't. Uh, what, uh, Susan would like to know, what does the TSH with reflex to FT4 refer to? Mine is 0 0.21. So the TSH with the reflex VT4 is our way of um, ordering labs and saying, I want you to check, you know, I want you to check Anne's TSH. If a TSH is abnormal, then I want you to run the free T4. So we do that in someone who's already on thyroid medication, right? Once you're on thyroid medication, all we really need is a TSH, but if your TSH is off, we want to know what your uh, T4 level is. So it's just a, a, an instruction to the lab. And you said that yours is 0 0.21. So they should have done your reflex speech T4 because I'm assuming that 0 0.21 is, is, is abnormal. That is your TSH. So you should have had your free T4 drawn and we may find that it's slightly high or towards the upper end of normal. Um, Thank you. 
Uh, Dion would like to know how often should blood work be done, especially if one month is low and then another month is normal? That's um, a good question, and that is a difficult one to answer. People who are on stable thyroid hormone replacement who generally stay stable and you really only need to do it once a year. You know, while you are still adjusting it, anytime you make an adjustment, you want to repeat uh, the thyroid blood work about six weeks to eight weeks later. Uh, now, when it's fluctuating from month to month, that's not a normal uh, situation. That's where we start looking at it and asking, are you taking it on an empty stomach? Are you taking other medications that may be affecting its absorption? Are you waiting, you know, are you, are you taking it along with calcium or iron? Are you waiting a long enough time uh, before you take your other medicines or eat? Uh, and so in, in people like that, yes, we do need to check it a little bit more frequently, maybe three months, six months. But more importantly, we need to figure out why it's fluctuating. And that may be a time when we'll consider trying brand names as well because it really shouldn't fluctuate from month to month. Thank you. So we just have um, a couple more questions. Um, Joanne is taking a multivitamin with iodine, cel selenet, selenium, <laughs> and biotin. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, but uh, she's also taking uh, levothyroxide for an auto uh, disease. Should I be taking this multivitamin? Um, I think that if, unless the iodine is, you know, in high amounts, there's no, so most multivitamins will have some iodine. Uh, but so that shouldn't be a problem. What you want to do, though, because of the biotin in it, if it again, small doses of biotin is not a problem. It wouldn't interfere with the assay. It's when you start taking bigger doses of, I, I, um, of biotin that we would now recommend. You can take it, but just hold the, the multivitamin for a few days before you do your blood work. So in your case, um, I would say, Joanne, just... Um, Keep taking it, but before you get your blood work done, just remember to hold your multivitamin for two or three days before you go and get blood drawn. Great. Okay, we just have a couple more minutes. Um, two more questions I think we'll have time for. Can you say a little bit about the relationship of underactive thyroid problems and diabetes and cholesterol and weight gain? Okay, so... Um, Having hypo, the untreated hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid gland uh, can cause you to put on weight, right, if you're not treated. If you're treated, you're not supposed to be any different than someone who has their intact thyroid. And I say you're not supposed to be. Um, untreated hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid gland can also cause your cholesterol to be a little higher than it should be. But if treated, it shouldn't have any impact on it. Um, in terms of diabetes, of weight gain, um, you know, in, a, in addition to uh, maybe a genetic predisposition to having type 2 diabetes, weight gain is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. So if you have untreated hypothyroidism and you were sort of borderline diabetic before and you put on some more weight, it can let tip you over to diabetes. But there's no direct relationship between underactive thyroid gland and diabetes per se. Great. Thank you. Last question. Betsy would like to know if my internal medicine doctor has been providing me with lab and medication for my hypothyroidism, should I be seeing an endocrinologist instead? Betsy, I would say no. You know, if your internal medicine uh, doctor is doing all of this, then, and, and, you know, there's nothing going on, then you don't need to see an endocrinologist. And actually what we are doing in our practice is that People like you, whom we have followed for years, we've actually now are beginning to send them back to follow up with their primary care. So um, your, your doctor is doing just everything that we would do for you. Wonderful. Thank you, doctor. We're out of time. I appreciate your expertise and all the great information. And we will uh, hopefully everybody fills out their survey. We'd love to have you again so that you can cover more topics on the thyroid. So thank you, Dr. Osaki.
Thank you for having me and thank you for listening and all the wonderful questions. And um, I'd love to, if you identify other areas that you'd like to discuss, I'll be more than happy to. Wonderful. Thank you.